Vic said I could have the last word now. Hallelujah. Everybody's so far away now. It's a little lonely up here. Title of this morning's message is Are You Protected? Are You Protected? As many of you know, the partial shutdown of our government has entered the record breaking 12th day as our Congress continues to play politics, blocking our President's request for $5 billion to fund a southern border wall to help protect our country from illegal aliens entering, with the average America in the process being the collateral damage to this political battle. Now, nobody, including myself, is delusional enough to believe that a physical wall is the final solution towards stemming illegal migration. Anybody resourceful enough will find a way into our country, whether at a checkpoint or using a fake passport or whatever. Even, even with the existing wall we have now, in some places elaborate tunnels have been dug, in other places the wall has been breached either by climbing over it or breaking through. But much of the importance of a wall is what it communicates. It declares a country's sovereignty to those on the outside and protection for those on the inside. And I believe it can be said a wall in many ways helps to protect the soul of a nation. But more important than what protects this nation is what protects our soul. From this morning's parsha bow, what protected God's people from the death angel that lurked on the outside, keeping them safe on the inside, was what? The blood of a perfect male lamb. And those uncovered and exposed outside met their death. But those inside and covered by the lamb's blood, they lived and they thrived. And so significant was this redemptive act of covering that God commanded that the month of Aviv or Nisan in which the Pesach took place, would mark the first of the year forever. And so to the people of Israel, God said, this will be a day for you to remember and celebrate as a festival to Yahweh from generation to generation. You are to celebrate it by, there's that word again, that phrase, perpetual regulation. It never ends. It always was and always continues. A perpetual regulation. But Hebrews 10.9 reminds us well, as well, that the, de the celebration of holy days is not just a reminder of what God has done, but is a shadow of good things to come. And we read from Rabbi Shul's letter to Rome, chapter 11, For out of Zion will come the deliverer, and he will banish ungodliness from Yaakov. And this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. So, as followers of the way, which we are, it is on Pesach that we remember and celebrate that Yeshua, the perfect Lamb of God, has been offered on the Passover altar, like the song says, once and for all, and to bear the sins of us, of many. Praise the Lord. Amen. But like the million that departed Egypt, we too, we're mixed. We're a mixed group here, aren't we? We're a mixed bunch. We're Jews, non-Jews, various cultures following the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. They were. For us that are not Jewish to partake of the Passover, God makes seems to make a distinction. He makes a distinction to us ger or foreigners that we too must be circumcised. Now whether participation is just limited to partaking of the sacrificed lamb or the meal in its entirety, that remains an ongoing debate amongst the rabbis. They can hash it out all they want. What is significant, though, is how both circumcision and observance of Pesach are related. That is, circumcision is an act of uncovering, while Pesach is an account of God's covering. And to understand this desire of God that men need to be circumcised to participate in the Pesach meal is to first understand the process all of us go through being born physically process that we go through being born physically into this world and then being born again spiritually, securing entrance into the world to come. So we are moving from a, a fleshly covering 
to a spiritual covering. Now, Avram was, what, 99 years old? We read in Breshit or Genesis 17 when Hashem appeared to him. And he said, Avram, I didn't say that, walk in my presence and be pure hearted. I'm establishing my covenant between me and you. You are to keep my covenant, you and your descendants after you, generation after generation. It is a sign you are to circumcise the flesh of your foreskin. And this includes every male generation after generation. Now we know that Avraham means exalted father. Well, exalted father became Avraham, father of many nations. And it was through Avraham's seed that the blessings of God would be passed. The sexual organ transferring that seed would be the sign of the covenant with God. And with the cut tissue circumvented around the sexual organ, the seed of Abraham and the sons of the promise have to pass through a Brit or a covenant area. It's the only commandment of all 613 literally sealed in the flesh. Literally sealed in the flesh. In fact, one of the oldest operations of humankind, believe it or not. It is. Often Messianic believers, we're all, we're all critical about uh, declaring certain practices as pagan. Well, that's pagan, right? You've all said it, right? Well, truth is, circumcision was a pagan practice that God adapted to his use. It's very, very significant that it's the male organ. Very significant. Because our sexual drive. We've got one Men, we have a sexual drive. And sadly, it influences a lot of our decision making. It often creates in our lives some of the biggest mistakes we ever make in our life. Amen? Some men? Nobody's going to say, like, well, no, no, he's talking to me. <laughs> talking to somebody here, it's not me. <laughs> right? You didn't hear a big amen there, ladies, did you? Oh, I don't know what he's talking about. Right? Don't pay no attention to him. <laughs> now, if you heard this joke, if you heard this before, Okay, forgive me. But there's an online, online dating site, you know, there's a lot of those online dating sites, you know, okay. And uh, on one of the online sites was the following ad. There was no picture, but it was an ad. It said, single black female seeks compassionate male. Ethnicity is unimportant. I'm a very attractive girl who loves to play. Long walks in the woods. Ride in your pickup. See, it worked for me. Riding in your pickup truck, going on camping and fishing trips, cozy winter nights by a fire, and candlelight dinners will have me eating out of your hand. I'll be at the front door when you come home from work wearing only what God gave me. <laughs> Call 404-875-6420 and ask for Daisy, and I'll be waiting for your call. Over 15,000 men found themselves talking to the Atlanta Humane Society <laughs> about an eight-month-old black Labrador retriever. <laughs> I wished I had written that. <laughs> because that was genius. It is so, so important this area, men, be submitted to the Lordship of God. You know, I'm not going to go too far on a rant on this. But I have to tell you that so much of what we call women's issues today are not women's issues. There are men-initiated issues upon women. That's just the fact of the matter, man. There's no women issues if there are, if there are no men issues. And lack of submission to the to God and his lordship in that area of our life is one of the biggest problems in this world today. If we don't submit ourselves to God's desire for our sexuality, men, our family, children, and even grandchildren will eventually be ruined by the consequences of our sinfulness and our foolishness. So many of our social and moral issues today are a result of men in particular compromising sexuality. We are either the initiators in God's plan or the initiator of Hasatan's plan. We're one or the other. It's not in between. We can take the lead morally or we can take the lead immorally. Amen? Yeah. 
Amen? Amen? Amen. Okay. Now let me repeat what I expressed recently. Abortion is not a female issue. It's a man issue. We have the power of creation. We are the initiators of creation. We need to get it back. And this society today is trying to chickify everything. I love that phrase. All our movies. You notice how every movie coming out today are sequels of women lead characters now, not men? They're taking every man movie and they're turning it into a women's movie. What's the latest? You know what the latest one is? Top Gun. Top Gun's coming back out. Chick pile at this time. Not kidding. We're taking, we're feminizing America and we're diminishing the significance of men in our world today. And men, it's about time that we rise up and assert the God-given role that we have and use it in a godly and submitted way that God had intended for us. Amen? It's our time we start acting like men, not like little boys. Men, we are wounding our sisters with our selfishness. We are wounding our sisters with our selfishness. Circumcision is a vivid reminder of our need to submit our sexuality to God. If you got your Bibles, and I know I do, I want you to at least have available to you the prophet Yirmiyahu, or Jeremiah, and we're going to be starting in uh, chapter, chapter 9, chapter 9. And... Uh, In chapter 9, we're going to be like in verse 7. And basically, I'm going to present to you the context here. Chapter 9, verse 7, Jeremiah. The southern kingdom of Judah, or Yehuda, had been enjoying a season of peaceful reform under King Yoshiah, or Josiah. There's been a return to godliness. There's a return to Torah observance and traditions. He particularly took a special interest in the celebration of Pesach or Passover. Now the climate changes dramatically upon his death in 609. When Josiah or Yoshia is succeeded briefly by a son, Jehoahaz, whose reign lasted just about three months, and then he was succeeded by his brother, Jehoiakim. Now, under Jehoiakim's reign, again, the spiritual climate changes dramatically. Where the people had a shared vision and direction, now there's complacency. There's greed. There's lack of civility. There's even cruelty amongst each other. Jehoiakim undid everything the father had worked for. And all the good things that took place under his father's reign. There's violence. There's adultery. Sexual indulgence. Even child sacrifices were blatantly practiced. And we may not be today cutting them open upon a stone altar like they did then, but today we are sacrificing our children on the altar of the media. They should be ashamed, said the prophet Yirmiyahu. They're not ashamed at all. That was a revelation from the prophet. Nobody likes to hear the words of a prophet. I hear it all the time. I'm not saying I have a prophetic gift, but I, I speak truth, and that's one of the roles of a prophet. <clears throat> a lot of people tell me I ought to tone it down. Maybe I ought to avoid saying certain things. But you know what? I can't do it. I can't go against my nature. They weren't ashamed. And the reason they weren't ashamed is because people weren't speaking up about it. In fact, the prophet said they don't even know how to blush. So we read in verse 9 of Yirmiyahu chapter 7, or chapter 9, verse 7, I should say. Therefore, says Yahweh Sabaot, I will refine them and test them. What else can I do with my sinful people? And then down to verse 25. Nine, verse 25. The days are coming, says Yahweh, when I will punish all those who have been circumcised in their uncircumcision. It's an interesting statement there. Circumcised in their uncircumcision. Egypt, Yehuda, Edom, the people of Mon and Moab, and all those living in the desert who cut the edges of their beard. For although all the Goyim are uncircumcised, 
all the house of Israel have uncircumcised hearts. I don't know, but God seems to be saying something here, doesn't he? <laughs> he seems to be saying, I'm not surprised. Look, I'm not surprised by this kind of behavior by the uncircumcised goyim. Brothers and sisters, I'm not surprised by a lot of what takes place in this world outside of submission to the Lord. Don't be surprised by the world you're living in. Don't be shocked by it. Nor was God surprised by such behavior by the uncircumcised goyim. But you, says Hashem, you who have been circumcised are worse off. You have, you should have known better. And yet your hearts remain uncircumcised. You should have known better. You're the ones who knew the Torah. You should have known. They didn't know any better. I have spoken to men before about these truths. We initiate what is passed on to generations. If we are complacent, brothers and, and brothers in particular, in our relationship with God, what happens is our children and our communities will be complacent. I will not be moved, as the song says. I will not be complacent. If that bothers you, then you're in the wrong congregation. If we are violent, they will be violent. If we are greedy, they too will be greedy. If we are deceptive, they will be deceptive. If we engage in sexual sins, so will they. If those sins bring new life, we will be responsible for their sacrifice in the altar of abortion. <coughs> That's the number one killer of African-American babies today. Right? Abortion. The same complacency Violence, greed, deception, and lust of Jehoiakim's kingdom is being experienced today. A physical circumcision, brother and sister, is not enough to protect Israel from their sinful behavior. It's not enough. The most sinful place in the face of this earth right now is Israel. I've said that many times. They take the, the lead in every area of moral compromise. In every nation in the world, Israel is the worst. It is. The Holy Land is the worst. It's not enough for physical circumcision to protect Israel from the consequences of their behavior. Their being saved from the consequences of their action depends upon another circumcision, one that takes place within a penitent heart. Not only is there the physical circumcision of Rashid 17, of Genesis 17, but now we're introduced in the Torah to a second circumcision. Devarim of Deuteronomy 10, 16, God tells us to circumcise the foreskin of our hearts. Here we find in the Torah a physical circumcision, but surprisingly to, to many, why I don't know, a spiritual one as well. A circumcision of the heart and a Chapter 30, verse 6, so that you will love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, in order that you may live. The quality of your life, brothers and sisters, if you hear anything I say this morning, the quality of your life in the manner or degree God blessed you depends solely on the circumcision of your heart before him. Apart from a circumcised heart, physical circumcision did nothing more than making one cultural attached to his people. It's just a, cult, it's a cultural connection. That's all it is. God intended circumcision not just as a tribal marking, but to be a physical reminder, an outward sign of a redemptive inner work. The physical act of circumcision pictures for us what it means to be spiritually circumcised. In physical circumcision, there's a removal of a veil of flesh uncovering what was hidden. That's exactly what takes place spiritually when individuals allow the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, to circumcise or uncover our hearts and reveal to you what is hidden there. I participate partially in that process. I'm a, 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 an instrument of the Ruach HaKodesh. But that's not the only part. Shabbat services and a challenging message for me is not the whole Shabbat. It's 
It's your own time of prayer. It's the Holy Spirit speaking through others in your lives. It's time where you spend in your word and the, and the words jump out at you and convict you and challenge you. That's all that combined. That's all that combined. You find, you find out really what's really going on inside of you. It's an uncovering and a revealing of what is hidden in your hearts. We go through that. Jews for centuries have gone through that act with uh, Benikat Chametz, the uncovering of leaven in the houses. When you go around, you look at every corner, you try to find any little bits of leavening, like breadcrumbs or something. The whole point of that is to uncover that which is hidden, that could leaven or represent sin or compromise in your life. And we want to sweep that out by the Holy Spirit. We want to use the light of Yeshua to get in there with the Ruach and clean that up with that feather and take it outside and burn it so it has no way of getting back into our lives. We experience this in the new birth. And that happens when we enter the mikvah spoken of in Rabbi Shaul's letter to Colossi. We spoke at length last Shabbat about that letter to Colossi and about how we need in 2019 to be Strictly Yeshua focused. And that's what the congregation, the Colossi was. It was a congregation, like I said, just like ours. Just like ours. Small town congregation led by a non Jewish leader. But was influenced by the teaching and the witness of Rabbi Shaul. And the congregation was thriving. And Rabbi Shaul spoke to that congregation. And he laid out where their priorities need to be, where the emphasis needs to be. And in the end, all that Rabbi Shaul said to this congregation was, you need to be focused on Yeshua. That's all you need to be worried about. Because this congregation is mostly non-Jews and a few smattering Jews. Don't worry about rabbinical traditions. Don't worry about other religions or philosophies or ideologies. Don't worry about any of that. Just fix your gaze on Yeshua. That's all you need to be concerned about. So trust your leader, Epaphras. And so in chapter 2, that same letter, Rabbi Shul is talking about being separated from our flesh to no longer identify with the flesh, but now in the spirit. And he says also in union with him that you were circumcised with circumcision, not done by human hands, but accomplished by stripping away the old nature's control over the body. In this circumcision, done by the Mashiach, you were buried along with him by being immersed. And in union with him, you were also raised up along with him by God's faithfulness that worked when he raised Yeshua from the dead. You were dead because of your sins. You were dead because of your sins. That is because of your foreskin, your old nature. But God has made you alive. <laughs> alive along with the Messiah by forgiving you all your sins. Now, Abraham was chosen to be the father of the children of God physically. But he was also declared to be the father of all who are spiritually the children of God. And just as physical circumcision of Breshit 17 is a sign of the covenant with those physically born into the house of God, Israel, so is the spiritual circumcision of Colossians 2 the sign of the covenant with those born spiritually into the people of God, non jew now, the initial act of circumcision was the seal of Abraham's faith in God's promise of possessing the land. It was an indication that Abraham, in his heart, believed God's word. He believed God's word, and he believed in a coming Mashiach. He believed in a redeemer, the promise of the prophet. He, he believed in a coming deliverer. There was no written word at the time. Still, Abraham, in his spirit, obeys, responds to God anyway by faith and desire. What can I do to bless you, God? We challenged you with that many, many weeks back. Do you start your prayers, your prayer time with God? Do you, is your attitude as you begin your day not what God can do for you, but what you can do for God? <laughs> is it, what can I do for you today, God? How can I bless you today, God? How can I serve you today, God? How can I witness about you today, God? How can I honor you today, God? Taking yourself completely out of the equation. Completely 
out of the equation. That's where Abraham was. <laughs> the things that he did, he did out of a desire to bless his creator. And he separated himself unto the Lord and unto the Lord's promise. And we struggle with that daily. We don't like, because of commitment and convictions, to be separated. We don't like it. We don't want to stand out. We don't want to be alienated. We don't like it. And again, in our portion from Romans 4, verse 9, now is this blessing for the circumcised only? Or is it also for the uncircumcised? For we say that Abraham's trust was credited in his count as righteousness, but what state was he in when he was so credited? Circumcision or uncircumcision? Not circumcision, no, it was uncircumcision. In fact, he received circumcision as a sign, as a seal of righteousness he had been credited with on the ground of trust that he had still uncircumcised. This happened so that he could be the father of every uncircumcised person who trusts and thus has righteousness credited to him or them. See, the true significance, brothers and sisters, of circumcision was not the physical act. If that's what you're looking, if that's what you're dwelling on, you've missed it. It's not the physical act, but in the reasons that the ritual was begun in the first place. Circumcision was intended to be an outward sign that something inwardly had taken place, namely Abraham's salvation of his covenant relationship with God. Circumcision was also a seal. Now what is a seal? Right? What is a seal? It's like the old letters they used to, you know, seal them with like you know, with uh, wax, and you had a little stamp and everything in the old days, you used to do that. Some of you had grandmas that still like put little, little, little stickies on there where they seal the envelope and stuff, you know. A seal indicates the validity of the thing to which it is attached. A seal itself has no significance apart from that which it covers. Its value is upon what the seal covers. You know, I, um, I'm going to thank, you know, David had hit you all up for a little bit of money as a gift for our family, and I appreciate it. Thank you, David. And we use that money to buy TV, part of it. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, as I do, like when you buy like expensive electronics, it's a process <laughs> to unpackage it, right? Because they go to great lengths to do what? To protect it. Something of great value is in that box. So there's styrofoam everywhere and plastic, and you know. It's covered up because what's un under all that wrapping and protection is something of great value. The box itself is worthless. We do with all that styrofoam crap. I have to go slip on it. It was funny, I took it over to, the, to recycle. The lady gets out of her car and goes, she goes, Well, you had a nice Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> true story. But uh, circumcision is like that. Circumcision is a seal attached to something very, very valuable, and namely our salvation. The most valuable, the most valuable possession that you have is your salvation. All the things you strive for in this life, all the things you hope for and want and desire, your salvation. It's the most important possession you have, of greatest value that you have. Amen? Hence the paradox. The paradox. If, you, if we have something of value, <clears throat> do we allow it to remain uncovered? <laughs> Did I, you know, I, don't we cover up what we value? I was thinking this the other day. Most of us probably have a garage. Some of us don't, right? Some of us don't have a garage. Isn't it funny? In, in the physical sense, apart from our salvation, two of the most valuable things that we own in our life are our houses and our cars. <laughs> and we just leave them out <laughs> in the driveway. But we keep our TVs all tucked away in the house. But, but the car, you know, the several thousand dollar cars just sitting out in the driveway. And that's, and I, that's the way I think. But it's kind of crazy. But that's the paradox. Normally, if we have something of great value, we cover it up. We protect it. You know, if, if you got a brand new car, what are you going to do? You're going to put it in the, dry, in the garage, if you have one. You know, if you don't have a, 
the garage, maybe you'll throw a car cover on it. And in my office, I've got you know, several certificates that are great value to me, and they have a seal on them. Um, and, and I keep those documents covered under glass in little frames and everything to protect them. Um, don't you have insurance? A lot of you have insurance for cars, your houses, etc. Life insurance, what do, you, what do you have insurance for? To cover and protect, that's what is of greatest value to you, right? I have life insurance for my kids. I, you know, I have health insurance, you know, protect this, you know, I value that. And the Torah, we go through a whole process with the Torah. Nobody, you know, Rochelle went to a lot of trouble to hand crochet this, or hand, whatever you call it, all right? So we go to all this trouble to make this cover. Why don't we just leave it uncovered, leave it open? Because it's of great value to us, is it not? The Word of God is of great value to us, and we want to see it covered and protected. Amen. Amen. Men of Israel, covered by the flesh of circumcision, were recovered in the blood of the Lamb. What God has uncovered, God also recovers. When God saw households covered in the blood of the sacrificed lamb, what did he do? He passed over. Literally, that means he covered. He covered or protected and hovered there and remained there, protected from death outside the doors. And I don't believe God intended his Judaism interprets that the uncovering of the male order of itself was to be redemptive. And somehow, because he had circumcision, you're going to Olam Haba. If these are a redeemed people, circumcision should have been enough. Right? If they were redeemed, circumcision should have been enough. They've been circumcised. What's the difference? Why do they need anything more? There's no need for a blood covering, right? No need. If you're already circumcised, you don't need the blood covering. The fleshly uncovering is a reminder of the spiritual covering that we all desperately need. Our salvation is of importance to us, and it is valuable to us. Our hearts, when open and exposed to God, are vulnerable, right? Why do you think it's so hard for us to open up to each other. Why do you think that is? Right? Some of you have gone to counselors. Some of you have a best friend. Some of you come to the rabbi or the pastor to talk. Why is it so hard? Why do you think it's so hard? Because you're vulnerable. Because when you open up your heart, you're vulnerable. And we don't want to be wounded. And we don't want to be hurt. And we don't want to be betrayed. And men especially struggle with this because we're warriors. <laughs> but we are. we are. We have to be strong. That's why we compartmentalize everything. We put our emotions in a box and close it up. We put our family in a box and we close it up. It's time to go to fight, we go to fight. It doesn't matter. That's why we can deal with these things. It's different for a woman. God made us different. Intentionally. There's no confusion there. Not like the world. We have a special struggle since our mode is to first protect. And that's the very thing that God is calling us to do. To remove the veil of flesh that covers our hearts and to open up our hearts. And if we open them up, know this God's not going to leave them open or exposed. He's not going to do that. He's not going to do that. He's not going to leave them unprotected. When we remove the veil of flesh, what remains? The blood. And we know in the blood is life. And the uncovered flesh is our reminder of fleshly ways that we keep hidden in secret. But what's important to us is in the actual act when blood, blood is spilt, we share in the valuable spilt blood of the Messiah, whose blood we know secures the protection of our salvation required by the atonement realized through his blood. The blood that has recovered our souls from the disease of sin that inhabits our flesh. Now women are sitting there thinking, I'm not really relating to this uh, circumcision. Understand her. But you're not outside of this either. No, no, no. You're not outside of all this either. Because when you consummate your union with a man, what was once closed has been opened or uncovered. And often there is evidence of blood. So there is blood in every aspect of covenant. 
Now I'm going to wrap this up. It's going to be pretty short because I think I'm really getting to the point. I don't need a lot of words. As Rabbi Solomon once said, <coughs> end that thing. <laughs> rabbi Solomon is a wise rabbi in the Atlanta area. Maybe you had a chance to see him, George and Lisa. He's a Baptist rabbi, if you can imagine such a thing. <laughs> Circumcision is a fun... Now you might not have ever heard this before, and I think it's danced around quite a bit, but circumcision is a fundamental aspect of the good news. And we talked at length about the good news last Shabbat. It is a spiritual reality for all individuals born from above. And that doesn't matter if you're Jewish or not Jewish. It makes no difference. We all need Jew and non-Jew, men and women. It's right there, Rabbi Shul tells us. We all need spiritual circumcision. We all need it. Established in the Torah and taught by Yeshua's Talmudim. What more do you need? It's in the Word of God and it's exampled in the witness of life of Yeshua and his disciples. And though Gentile believers don't share physical descendancy from Abraham, we all can share in spiritual descendancy. One gospel, and one family, and one Messiah, and one Torah. One Messiah is head over all. By virtue of of Messiah and our spiritual circumcision, we all become citizens of Israel, fulfilling the requirement to participate in the Pesach. We are all circumcised through our covenant with Messiah Yeshua. But what of physical circumcision for us not Jewish, if we have had the foreskin of our hearts removed? See, Rabbi Shalul taught in 1 Corinthians 7.19, that circumcision or uncircumcision mean nothing in regards to the recovery of our souls. It means nothing. But he did say obeying the commandments is everything. Now to have the same heart of our own, to be a faithful, obedient servant, it means everything. It was credited to him righteousness because of his faithfulness and his obedience. And circumcision was a sign the seal of his obedience and his commitment to God. Remember, Abraham did things before God asked him to. I wish I had kids that did that. And you as children of God, God wishes that you would do that. That you would do things before he commands you. Right? As Linda said, we're commanded to observe the Shabbat. That is absolutely true. But he also invites us. He desires it. He would like it. Imagine doing things or looking for things before he, to do before he even asks us. Amen? That's what Abraham kind of man he was. He tied before God requested all of us to do so. He preceded the circumcision. That's the kind of man that Abraham was and the love of God he had, trying to anticipate God's desire, Hashem's heart. That's relationship. <laughs> that You want to be in a relationship? You want to have a friendship? You want to have a marriage? If that's what you really want, well, let me give you an idea what that's about. Anticipating beforehand what the desire of the other's heart is. Thinking about what they would be blessed with, what they would want before your own. Anticipating their heart. To have the same kind of heart means everything. And because of it, it means everything, it's got to be protected. It's valuable. It's eternal. Circumcision for us is an important reminder of what the sins of our flesh have cost the Son of God. You know, our president declared this week at our southern border, the wall is not meant to communicate we hate the people outside of it, but rather it communicates we love the people within it. 
all are welcome to enter this country, just like my mother did as a German immigrant. All are welcome here. If we do so as this nation desires us to do so legally. God loves his people. God loves his people that have entered into his covering by the blood of the Lamb, Yeshua, protected by the fence of Torah. The wall for America is a sign that we are a protected nation that loves our people. Circumcision is a sign that God so loved the world that he gave his son. That all who enter into that relationship by the blood of the Lamb of God will know his love and have protected souls. So the question today, after all that I've said, do you know for sure that your life is protected? Are you protected? Are you circumcised in the heart? That's an important question to ask because there's no more valuable question you'll ever answer in your life than that one right there. And if you don't know, now's the time to answer that question. Please rise. And as we all bow our heads and we close our eyes, I don't spend a lot of time with altar calls. Because I know the reality that most of the people that walk in this door know Yeshua. They've had their hearts circumcised. But if one of those people are you, if you're not sure that you have uncovered your heart to the Lord so, and exposed those fleshly areas of your life and want to receive the covering of God's Ruach HaKodesh, the salvation that He promises through the blood that he allowed spilt from his son. If you have a doubt, I would say now's the time, brothers and sisters. Raise that hand. Raise that hand if you have a doubt. Father, in Yeshua's name, if there's a doubt here this morning about the condition of anybody's soul, if there's a doubt anywhere here, Father, that we have merely depended upon the flesh, the physical circumcision, if not uncovered our hearts to receive the eternal blessing that was given us by the spilled blood of your Son, the most valuable treasure that we could ever possess in this life. If we are not sure we are entering into the fence or defined area of salvation and protection, I pray in Yeshua's name, Father, that you would reach into every heart and life and draw your people to that place because you want us here. You love us here. You want to see us forever in the kingdom. Thy kingdom come, but thy will be done. So, Father, thank you again for these words that show us, Father, that what we do in the flesh is nothing more than a sign of what should have happened in our spirits. And if it has not happened, Father, let us take this opportunity, Father, to circumcise our hearts so that we will, too, know the protection and the love within your defined area. In Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Sadonai Pavlecha, Visim Lecha, Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you, be gracious unto you. And I pray the Lord lift his count upon you, and he grant you his shalom. Hashem Yeshua Adonai, the congregation agrees? Amen. Amen. Be blessed.